Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. I'm so glad that you decided to click on this video. If you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much for being here. I hope that you will enjoy this new video that I've got. It's been a very, very crazy couple of months. I moved house, I got a new job, so I hadn't really had any time to film or research, but today's case is one that I have spent a very long time putting a lot of time and energy into. This is still a very raw case and it's still hitting very close to home for the family. Now, I was 14 when this attack happened, and it was a very, very shocking case here in New Zealand. So I haven't covered too many New Zealand cases. I've done two, the Bain family murders and the case of Minnie Dean, but this is probably one of the most notorious cases in New Zealand history, partly because of the violent nature of the attack and partly because of the way that the trial unfolded and how horrendous the defendant was on the stand. So today I am talking about the murder of Sophie Elliott at the hands of Clayton Weatherston. Part of the reason it took me so long to bring this case to you is because I really wanted to make sure that I did the story justice. And when I read the book, Oh my gosh, you guys, it was really, really intense. It's very, very emotional. Reading about Leslie's trauma and her pain was really confronting. In writing Sophie's Legacy, the Elliot family are really striving to restore pride and respect to Sophie's name. And she deserves that. Now I'll give you guys a heads up. This video is going to be long, so please stick with me. I will include chapters as well, so you can skip ahead or you can take a break and circle back to come and watch it. I did wonder if you would prefer it to be broken up into multiple parts. Most of you said you wanted it all in one big long video, so here we go. Now, before we go ahead and get into today's video, please go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and hit subscribe because I'm sure you will not be disappointed. So Sophie Kate Elliott was born on the 11th of June, 1985 in Ravensburn, Dunedin to Gil and Leslie Elliott. Sophie was the third child to the couple and she was the only girl. She was also the youngest with two older brothers, Chris and Nick, and they were seven and 11 years older than her respectively. Sophie's mother, Leslie, described Sophie as being a real girly girl. She loved to dress up and she loved to dance and started ballet from the age of just four. But it wasn't long before Sophie branched out and began to express herself through different forms of art. She took a keen interest in drama and music and loved to take part in stage shows. Leslie said that seeing Sophie perform on stage was just incredible and she couldn't believe what she was seeing and hearing. Sophie was just so full of life and just loved to express herself through art and dance. Sophie had arrived a little unexpectedly for the couple, with the two nearing closer to 40. But this did mean that there was quite a significant age gap between Sophie and her two older brothers. When Sophie was just 11, her brother Nick decided to move to Australia. And just one year later, her brother Chris moved out to go flatting. Sophie's father Gil was also often traveling for work, which meant that Sophie and Leslie were often left at home together for extended periods of time. And because they were the only girls in the family and they spent a lot of time together, they became more than just mother and daughter. And Leslie said that their relationship was like best friends. They formed a very, very deep bond. One thing that was regularly commented on about Sophie was that she was a incredible student. She was very smart, very diligent, and always excelled in all areas of her school life. From the arts right through to English and maths, she really, really applied herself. In fact, when she graduated St. Hilda's Collegiate College, which is 
a high school here in New Zealand, she graduated with the Proxime Assessit Cup, which is an award given to the second highest achieving student in the school, which is honestly remarkable. Her former principal at high school said that Sophie embodied the quintessential St. Hilda's girl. She said that Sophie had twinkling eyes and a drive that would see her go on to achieve incredible things. But of course, Sophie wasn't just an academic, having shown a immense love of arts and drama from a very young age. She won the Best Actress Award in 2003 at her high school and was said to have boundless energy and incredible work ethic across arts and drama and academics. In Sophie's legacy, Sophie's mother, Leslie, talks about how Sophie took immense pride in her appearance. No matter where she was going or what she was doing, Sophie would always make sure that she took the time to look her best. She loved to make sure her hair looked good, to do her makeup and put together carefully thought out outfits. During high school, along with being an incredibly amazing academic student, as well as excelling in arts and drama, Sophie started to develop a real passion for photography. She began to explore this passion further when she took on a part-time job on the side working at a photo studio called Spectra. And she would work here after school and on weekends and her mother said that she had no idea how Sophie managed to fit it all in. And partly why this is so incredible is that Sophie actually did two first year university papers in her final year of high school as well as working part time and as well as getting top marks across all of her subjects and doing performing arts and plays on the side as well. So she re she was like a real go-getter and really applied herself at, and excelled at everything that she did. Sophie really loved her time working part-time at that photography studio. And later after her death, the owners went on to express what an incredible asset Sophie really was to the business. She was incredibly patient with the customers and always took the time to help them get the solution that they wanted, make sure that they understood how technology worked and Customers just loved her because she was just a lovely person. During the trial, which we will discuss in more depth later, Sophie's friends, family, acquaintances, everyone who knew her were truly, truly heartbroken by the way that her character was just completely defamed and taken apart. In reality, they said that Sophie was a beautiful character, a loyal, loving, trustworthy person. She was caring and affectionate and part of the mission since the trial ended has been to restore that honor to Sophie's name. When Sophie graduated high school, she went on to study economics at the University of Otago. And it was here that her path tragically crossed with that of Clayton Weatherston. In the last year of her degree in 2007, sometime around her 22nd birthday, Sophie was working late at the university one night when she was approached by an older man. It was one of her lecturers, 33-year-old Clayton Weatherston, and he asked if she would like to go for dinner with him. And Sophie said yes. Clayton Robert Weatherston was born on the 9th of January 1976 in Dunedin. He was the third child and second son to Roger and Yulene Weatherston. His two siblings were Angela and Gareth. The Weatherston family are well known in the suburb of Green Island. Gareth worked as the chairman of the Green Island Rugby Club, Roger as a self-employed industrial electrician, and Yulene on the switchboard at the Otago Polytechnic. Yulene described Clayton as a tense and anxious child, finding any sort of change incredibly stressful. But overall, she said that Clayton was a happy and easy kid. But Clayton did have his problems, um, such as bedwetting, which, as we know, is not uncommon in people who go on to become murderers, as well as poor eyesight, which he detailed to the court later on in the trial, saying that he found this otherness to be very anxiety inducing and at the time glasses weren't trendy and he didn't want to wear them and he got teased. Apparently in a Form 1 maths class, Clayton was deeply humiliated when he got a mere 
14 out of 20 questions right on a maths quiz and his teacher said to him in front of the whole class in a condescending way, are you blind? Apparently he was told that by the age of 19 he wouldn't be able to see what was on the plate in front of him. And this is where we kind of begin to see the early stages of Clayton's um, self-absorption and inflated sense of self-importance that he would feel it was even appropriate to talk about that at the trial anyway despite his trouble with his vision Clayton really loved sport and he was an active player in his rugby team and he played wing for the Green Island Rugby Club apparently helping them go on to have a five-year streak being unbeaten so he was quite good at it he had a big circle of friends mostly other rugby players from the rugby club too but apparently the odd person at school did later come out and say that actually Clayton was a huge weirdo and they felt a bit uneasy around him. Clayton's chronic anxiety continued to become an issue into his adolescence. For example, when the rugby team would travel out of town for a tournament, instead of staying with his team wherever they were allocated to stay for accommodation, His mum would come with him and they would book out a motel together, just the two of them, and they would stay together to help reduce his anxiety. Towards the end of his high school years, Clayton's obsessiveness and arrogance began to become on full display more and more. He was determined to achieve not just good grades, but perfect grades, like a completely perfect track record he just couldn't even handle it if he got anything less than perfect so any of his extracurricular activities such as the rugby club definitely fell by the wayside so that he could focus on getting top marks and it actually worked because when he graduated high school he graduated as the ducks which is literally the top student top performing student in the school but even then that wasn't enough for Clayton he still wasn't satisfied apparently he was extremely disappointed by his external examination performance and he later said that that was because of his anxiety so even though Clayton had this obsessive quest for perfection in his academic performance He really struggled to perform well in his external examinations because of his anxiety. In fact, he would go so far as to throw up from the nerves and it became quite crippling for him. So he ended up being able to attain a medical certificate that would allow him to resit the examinations at a later date. But he later told the court that he felt like it really held him back. Later, when Clayton went on to university, He developed a really shitty habit of just dropping any paper that he didn't get perfect marks in. And I'm talking anything less than an A plus grade, he would drop it. In fact, he dropped out of the same paper two years in a row because he couldn't get an A plus, even though he could easily have achieved an A or an A minus. So obviously this little habit of his meant that it took him a really, really, really long time to graduate from university because he never finished anything. Finally, in 1998, following the breakup of a four year long relationship, Clayton finally decided to seek professional help to deal with his anxiety. So he went and saw an on-campus doctor um, at the university who he discussed his anxiety with and how he was not very resilient in the face of change or stress. And it was at this time that the doctor prescribed him Prozac. Apparently, Clayton says he stayed on antidepressants for the next several years, a really long time. And you might be wondering, why is that relevant? It's relevant because they brought it up in the trial as to whether or not it was a side effect of the medication that he was taking. So finally, six years after he began his university studies, he graduated in the year 2000. Straight away, instead of taking a break, he went on to start his postgraduate diploma in economics. In 2003, Clayton began work at the Treasury in Wellington, 
But strangely, just nine months later, he returned home to Dunedin much, much sooner than expected, having left his job. And he would say that it was because of health reasons, but later rumors had it that actually it's because he was not very well liked at all. He was not popular and he had a tendency to rub people up the wrong way, which is not surprising. So then in May 2004, Clayton went on to begin a relationship with a woman who has name suppression. So I am going to refer to her as his ex-girlfriend or the woman. So she spoke of Clayton at the trial. Quote, He had a loving, generous side and a nasty and mean demeanor on the other. The private side was a fairly insecure person and someone who could be very mean and someone that got very worked up very easily and wouldn't be able to get over those things. Unquote. In late 2006, Clayton's relationship with this woman came to an end. Apparently, she later told the court that she had been just trying to go to sleep and he was playing his guitar in the bedroom and no matter how many times she asked him to stop playing, he kept playing intentionally to upset her. So she put her hand on the strings of the guitar to be like, shut up, and he just like lost the plot with her and he started jumping up and down on her back and kicking her and he caused her nose to bleed even. So he actually later told the court at trial that he believed he could have killed her during this incident. She also spoke of Clayton Weatherston's extreme mood swings. Apparently when they broke up, they parted on relatively good terms and had even remained friends. But later she accidentally sent him a romantic text message that was meant for somebody else. And once again, Clayton hit the roof. Apparently he lost the plot, he was slamming her car door, he told her that he was disgusted in her and never wanted to have anything to do with her again. Apparently, when he was later asked about his outbursts, he said that he was concerned about his finances and felt that he was subsidizing his girlfriend's lifestyle and he was worried about his academic future. So, you know, like all his own personal problems that he would violently take out on his ex-girlfriend. Apparently the woman said that Clayton later tried to amend the issue and he even showed up at her work one day. Um, apparently he was absolutely bawling, crying, devastated, saying that he loved her and his life's a mess and he's such a screw up and all of that obviously after what she'd been through she was not having a bar of it and she didn't buy his bullshit and said no the relationship is over and stuck to her guns and honestly good for her so during this time Clayton had bought a $200,000 flat in Dunedin and he had received a PhD scholarship now I tried to find out more details about his PhD scholarship and how he came to get it. I don't even know what his scholarship was called. I couldn't really find anything about that, but he got a scholarship um, and he bought this flat that he was living in with the girlfriend, uh, but his PhD money was running out and apparently that was what was contributing to the financial tension for him. To help cover the cost of the expenses that he had, he'd taken up a position as a lecturer in the Department of Economics at the University of Otago. And it was here that he crossed paths with Sophie Elliott, who was a student of his. So they began a relationship pretty quickly, but it was rocky right from the start. And within just three weeks of the two starting to date, Sophie was expressing concerns to her mother. Quote, She used to complain that he would never answer text messages, was often late for date arrangements, not ringing her when he said he would, that kind of thing. He liked to drink and socialised, yet the odd thing was he never asked Sophie to join in much of his socialising, yet he expected her to pick him up from various events. Often she didn't hear from him for days and when she did it was Sophie who had to fit in with his arrangements. As I said to Sophie, not a good start to a relationship. Unquote. Clayton's version of events is that Sophie became obsessed with him and he was flattered by the attention. 
In mid-2007, Sophie traveled to Wellington to interview for a position at the Treasury and she got the job. So she was due to start in January of 2008. This job involved a year of on-the-job training before all going well, a promotion to Treasury Analyst. Now, because Clayton had abruptly left the Treasury under a cloud, he became insanely jealous of Sophie's success and started threatening to derail things for her. He said that he would use his contacts at the Treasury to ruin her career. So obviously things were off to a bad start. Clayton was a piece of shit and threatening to jeopardize Sophie's career and the two were on again, off again. They would break up and get back together every other week or so. And this really frustrated Sophie's mother, Leslie. As you can imagine, being a mother, watching your amazing daughter being dicked over by this complete asshole who is much older, knows better, and is in a position of authority over her. Oh my God, that would be so frustrating to watch that happen. Quote, from a mother's perspective, I gained the impression he was messing around with her mind. She would sometimes come home in tears, saying she would never see him again, even though that was unlikely as he lectured one of her papers. A week later, she would say, Mum, you're not going to be very pleased, but Clayton wants me to give him another chance, so we're seeing each other again. I didn't realize it then, but now I see that this begging for another chance is a classic sign of an abusive person. And Clayton treated Sophie like shit, as we know, but at the time, Sophie and her family didn't recognize that what he was doing was actually classic signs of domestic abuse. Along with just generally treating her like shit, he would insult Sophie, calling her fat and ugly, and brag about all the girlfriends he had had before her that were, quote, much better than her. And of course, Clayton never took responsibility for his shitty behavior. Everything he ever did that was not great was because of somebody else or those around him. And weirdly, many of the arguments between the couple revolved around Clayton's constant need for affirmation of his sexual performance. In particular, he would always ask Sophie to tell him how he compared to her former sexual partners. He always wanted to know, was he number one? Eventually, Sophie finally got so frustrated with him asking such a stupid question that she told him the truth and said that no, he wasn't the best one. And of course, he got even more frustrated and angry and blamed her. So finally, their relationship ended in November 2007. Sophie was ready to graduate. She'd secured an amazing new job at the Treasury and she was prepared to move to Wellington and leave Clayton Weatherston behind her. To celebrate the end of the year, Sophie and her best friend Jess took a holiday to Australia to visit Sophie's brothers Nick and Chris. They began in Melbourne where they stayed with Sophie's brother Chris before traveling to Sydney to see her brother Nick. They finished up their trip with a bit of time at the Gold Coast to visit some of the theme parks. Sophie called Clayton just once during her time in Australia and he was very rude and dismissive and alluded to being with another woman. On the 15th of December 2007, Clayton threw a party of sorts to celebrate his PhD graduation. Sophie came along and she played photographer taking photos which was very much in line with her creative passion at that time. On the 27th of December 2007, Sophie had finally finished putting together a photo album of the photos that she took during that day, which honestly is so nice. Like this guy is such a piece of shit and she went and did such a beautiful gesture as to create this lovely book of photos of this occasion. Anyway, really kind after the way that he treated her, but she really wanted to give it to him before she moved. But when Sophie showed up to his flat, he turned physically violent. Leslie, Sophie's mother, describes this incident in the book Sophie's Legacy. Quote, he invited her to sit next to him and talk about where they were going. At that point, he began to get amorous. Sophie had no intention of having any further romantic attachment with him and asked him to leave it at that. He then suggested they go to the bedroom and she responded by saying, you're not getting the message, this is over. 
As soon as she stood to leave, his mood suddenly changed. He picked her up, carried her to his bedroom and threw her roughly onto the bed. Sophie began to scream and Weatherston straddled her and put one arm across her throat and a hand over her mouth. As they struggled, he began to abuse her with words like whore and slut. In the struggle, he lost his grip and Sophie was able to get free and run to her car. He followed her, opened the door and screamed, when you were flying back from Australia, I hoped the fucking plane would crash so you would be killed. Sophie's diary entry for that day read, quote, Lord, I hardly know where to start. Clayton assaulted me. When I went to leave, he went absolutely psycho. No exaggeration at all, I assure you. He told me I'm a fucking horrible person. Everyone hates me. I'm fucking ugly. He has never liked me, etc. While pinning me down with his entire body on his bed. I confess I was very scared and panicky. I've never had a guy use his weight against me like that. I knew he was furious and extremely unreasonable, unquote. Oh, so poor Sophie, after that horrendous, terrifying experience, she told her mother and the two of them decided not to tell her father and not to go to the police and press charges. And the reason being that at that point, Sophie was just like two weeks away from moving to Wellington. And the way that her and her mother saw it is in just a short space of time, she would finally be free of Clayton forever. And they just didn't want to start the process of like legal proceedings and possibly create more of a reason for Clayton to be in her life. And they also didn't want to tell her dad because they didn't want him to worry because you know that he would have. So after that happened, they decided just to leave it at that. Okay. On Wednesday, the 9th of January, 2008, Sophie and her mother, Leslie, were finishing up the last few bits of packing before Sophie's big move to Wellington. Sophie was dressed in a denim skirt, a white t-shirt, and a white cap-sleeved cardigan. She was working on her makeup in the morning to prepare for one final get-together with her friends that evening. They were going to have pizza on the beach and she knew that she had a super busy day ahead so she wouldn't have time any other time of the day to get it done. So she took her time in the morning to get ready for the big day ahead. Sophie's mum, Leslie, was feeling pretty emotional about Sophie leaving. The two were like best friends and she just knew that she was going to miss her very, very much. Sophie reassured her mum that she would come home regularly to visit her and that she'd already booked her trip back in Easter to spend time with the family. Leslie had been brought to tears by something that Sophie said, although she later said that she couldn't remember for the life of her what it was, but... In that moment, Sophie came over and gave her mum a big hug. And tragically, that would be the last hug that the two of them ever had. A few minutes later, there was a knock at the front door. And when Leslie opened it, she found Clayton Weatherston standing there grinning at her. He asked her if Sophie was in because he had something for her. Sophie stood at the top of the stairs and Leslie looked up at her. She silently turned her eyes to the ceiling and gestured to let him in. So Leslie let Clayton inside. Sophie told him that she was really busy and running late so that if he wanted to talk, it would have to be in her bedroom while she continued to pack her things. Leslie returned to the kitchen, although she felt very uneasy about leaving the pair alone after Clayton's recent assault on Sophie, so she instinctively turned off the radio. Apparently, Sophie's bedroom is right above the kitchen, so normal conversation could be heard as murmurs and any kind of shouting or raised voices would be heard very easily. But even with the radio turned off, Leslie heard nothing. It was completely silent. A few minutes later, Sophie appeared in the kitchen. She said Clayton was just sitting there on the bed, not saying a word. And Leslie said basically to just get rid of him because she had other things to do. Um, and that he probably just felt guilty for the way that he treated her the other day and wanted to make amends. Sophie agreed and thought, yes, that's probably it. Sophie returned to her bedroom and closed the door. Immediately after, Leslie heard a horrific scream and Sophie shouting, 
don't Clayton, don't Clayton, Leslie ran up the stairs and Sophie just kept screaming and screaming. She kicked and charged at the door, yelling for Clayton to open it but he wouldn't. Leslie raced back down to the kitchen to get a meat skewer out of the drawer and grab her cell phone while she was at it to dial 111, which is the emergency services number here in New Zealand. Leslie says she actually has no recollection of doing this. She just did it completely on autopilot. Sophie's door handle had a small hole in it to release the lock as a safety precaution and it could be undone by putting the meat skewer in it. And as Leslie tried desperately to steady her hands enough to get the skewer in the hole, she could just hear this rhythmic thumping and thumping over and over and Sophie screaming and screaming. She said that apparently her first thought was that Clayton must be raping Sophie on the bed and that was the sound of the thumping but then all of a sudden she heard Sophie take two gasps and then the screaming stopped but the banging kept on going. When Leslie finally managed to get the door open, she said she knew instantly that Sophie was dead. Clayton Weatherston was straddling her body, stabbing her violently in the chest. Even when Leslie broke into the room, he didn't stop. He didn't even say a word. He just kept on stabbing Sophie with his right hand while he tried to close the door with his left. Apparently, Leslie said that the room was just covered in blood but that Sophie was white as a sheet and that you don't normally go that white when you die but Sophie had lost such an enormous amount of blood in such a short amount of time that that's why she was so pale. Now the 111 call was never released to the public but Leslie says that on that call she can be heard scratching to get the skewer and the door handle opening the door and being confronted with just the most unimaginably, unimaginably horrific sight. And then you hear Leslie screaming, he's killed her, he's killed her, before the door being shut. The 111 operator instructed Leslie to leave the house and just get herself to safety. And Leslie realized that Sophie was truly beyond help at this stage. So she just made a run for it, tearing down the stairs. And she managed to get as far as the end of her driveway before just collapsing on the grass verge. Constable John Cunningham arrived first on the scene. He ran straight down the drive towards the house. Now he'd arrived alone because originally when they got the call, he thought that it was just another domestic. So he was like totally unprepared to go and confront an armed killer. Constable John Cunningham spoke at the trial, quote, I then heard the door being unlocked, so I opened it and stepped into a small bedroom. In front of me, to my left, was the body of a young Caucasian female on the floor. She was covered in blood around her neck and upper torso. A man was standing with his hands by his sides at the end of the bed next to the body. I said to this person, what have you done? To which he replied, I killed her. He was calm and reserved. He did not appear to be shaking or anything similar. He was in a normal state and in control of himself. When I told him to lie face down on the floor, he immediately complied. I then asked him, why did you kill her? He said, the emotional pain she has caused me over the past year. When I asked him what he killed her with, he said, a knife. I asked him where the knife was and he said, probably under her. I asked him about a pair of scissors between the victim's legs, to which he replied, I used them at the end. When I got him outside, I asked him whose blood it was smeared over his arms, legs and face, and he replied, a little bit mine, mostly hers. When I asked him who he had killed, he replied, it is Sophie Kate Elliott, 11th of June, 1985, unquote. The next day, on the 10th of January 2008, Clayton Weatherston appeared in court in Dunedin. He pled not guilty to the charge of murder. And what would follow was months and months of lengthy court proceedings and delays which just further traumatised the Elliott family. 
first there needed to be a committal hearing, otherwise known as a deposition or a preliminary hearing. On 26 of May 2008, Sophie Elliott's mother, Leslie, was the first to present evidence at the preliminary hearing. She described her account of what she experienced and witnessed on the 9th of January 2008. She talked about the rhythmic thumping and the soft sighs and how she thought that Clayton must have been sexually assaulting Sophie. And then she talked about what she saw when she opened the door. Leslie continued her testimony describing the on again off again nature of the relationship and how Clayton had verbally and physically abused Sophie in the months leading up to her murder. Throughout the time that Leslie presented her evidence, Clayton just looked completely disinterested. He was calm and composed and occasionally shook his head in like disagreement during her testimony, but when Clayton's ex-girlfriend took the stand, his demeanor completely changed. In his mind, his ex-girlfriend was like one of his allies to him during the trial and while he was incarcerated he would write to her frequently quote i have been better and have been thinking about you this is a rough ride and it's not looking like getting any easier i am in a cell 3.5 by 2.5 most of the day getting some time for a shower and outside in a small yard the good is pretty good knowing i have your support is crucial to me I am sorry for not seeing how great you truly are. I will talk slash see you and mum and dad as soon as possible. I am also sorry that such a horrible person has been glorified in the media. From what I have heard, that is our society. It will blow over. Not going to dwell on the uncontrollable, but rather on staying positive. There is unfortunately way too much time here to overanalyze. I have started to appreciate the small things in life already. I am nervous about court on Thursday and am annoyed my side will not be made public. I also expect a lot of ill will. I will focus on your continued positive energy to help me through it. Don't know what I'll be wearing. You is my one, Clate, unquote. Blech. But when the former girlfriend in question actually took the stand, she did not paint a very flattering picture of Clayton Weatherston. She described how he had a loving, kind side, but also a very mean and nasty side that he could flip to in an instant and never really displayed in public. She talked about the incidents where he had attacked her on various occasions, including the time that he was kicking and jumping on her when he lost the plot and started shouting at her and slamming the car door. She also talked about how Clayton would verbally harass her in the same way that he did with Sophie, especially around comparing to former sexual partners. And the entire time that she was giving her testimony, Clayton watched her intensely and even would start to weep openly at times during her testimony. On the second day of the committal hearing, the ex-girlfriend said that she'd spoken to Clayton two days before the death of Sophie Elliott and said that his mental state was, quote, of concern. Quote, Clayton was unusual. He was irate and discussed Sophie and his job over and over and over again. I think he was quite unwell, although I had heard him speak this way on occasion. I was quite concerned about him, unquote. The next to take the stand was the senior economics lecturer at the University of Otago. He was also Clayton's supervisor, Dr. Robert Alexander. Dr. Robert Alexander spoke of finding out about Clayton and Sophie's relationship in 2007. Sophie was in Dr. Robert Alexander's office when Clayton came by and knocked on the door. Now, um, Alexander is assumed that Clayton was coming to speak to him so he said that he was busy and he would get back to him shortly and then when he did leave Sophie looked at him and she was quite embarrassed and she said oh I, you know I, I I assume you know what's going on and at that point the lecturer stated his concern over the conflict of interest but Sophie assured him that she and Clayton had it under control and it was all going to be fine. However, Sophie then began to confide in Robert about Clayton's abusive behavior. And Robert later said that Sophie would speak of Clayton in, quote, quite negative terms. In October 2007, Clayton approached 
Dr. Robert Alexander and asked if his relationship with Sophie would negatively impact his chances of obtaining a permanent lecturing job. And the senior lecturer replied that, um, you know, that wasn't great, but it probably wouldn't have any major impact on his chances, but that he wasn't actually very good at his job anyway and wasn't very well liked, so he probably wasn't going to get it just because of who he was as a person. And in this particular instance, he was referring to a couple of times that Clayton had accused other members of the faculty of plagiarism. Clayton claimed to have co-written a paper with one of the other lecturers and the proceedings were even taken as far as mediation and it was ultimately found that Clayton had no basis or any grounds whatsoever to make a claim of plagiarism. He had, I think, mentioned the topic in passing or something and actually had nothing to do with the, co the writing of this paper anyway. After that instance, Clayton then went on to accuse the head of department of plagiarism, claiming that they stole an idea that Clayton had. So he was just so bit, like pig-headed and arrogant and completely lacking in self-awareness around how people saw him and he wasn't well-liked. Everywhere he went, he kind of burned bridges and pissed people off. Now then... Um, as part of the pre-trial hearing, they began to discuss the particulars of Sophie's injuries. And sadly, Sophie's family actually never got the autopsy report or never found out what happened to Sophie and had to find out during this deposition what happened to their daughter, which is really sad and part of what we'll discuss a bit later on is the way that this case was handled in terms of communication with the victim's family. Now I will warn you that the particulars of Sophie's injuries are quite troubling so just you know discretion is advised. So the pathologist relayed that Sophie had received a total of 216 stab wounds, including 40 in one eye and 20 in the other. Clayton had stabbed Sophie in the chest so many times that he had practically severed her heart in two. These injuries are detailed in Leslie Elliott's book, Sophie's Legacy. Quote, after she was dead, and God, how we have hoped and prayed she was dead, he defiled her by cutting off her ears and nose, a nipple from her breast, and parts around her genital area. As a final indignity, he cut off some of her hair and laid it across her face. Sophie had beautiful long hair. Why he did this, only he will know. Unquote. The depositions concluded on the 29th of May 2008. Following this, it was concluded that there was enough evidence to go to trial. Leading up to the trial, many pre-trial hearings took place to clear up any issues and basically decide on what can and can't be submitted as evidence in court. Among these pre-trial debates was where the actual trial would take place. The Tevents argued that there would be no chance of a fair trial in Dunedin and they wanted to have it moved to Auckland, which would have been incredibly unfair for the family because that's at the literal opposite end of the country. Ultimately, it was decided that the trial would take place at the High Court in Christchurch. A lot of the controversy surrounding the defence was whether or not it was appropriate for Clayton's defence counsel to use Sophie Elliott's diary in court. Sophie's mother, Leslie, d talks about this again in her book, Sophie's Legacy. Quote, One of the hardest things I've had to do is search through her diary trying to make sense of what happened, looking for entries that counter that man's claims. This wasn't easy and I couldn't read those diary entries without a box of tissues close at hand. I've cried buckets over what I was reading, partly because of the content, but mainly because I felt I was prying. Sophie and I had a close and open relationship, and she confided in me over many issues. Sometimes I would say, too much information, Soph, but her diary is private. Sacrosanct, in fact. I have always believed that her diary should not become public property. 
unquote. In the end, both the prosecution and the defense decided to use parts of Sophie's diary during their arguments. In total, there were five pre-trial hearings, two trial delays, and then the date was finally set for the 22nd of June 2009, a whopping 18 months after Sophie Elliott was killed. So as the trial neared, it became clearer what kind of defense Clayton's team were going for. And in the end, they decided to focus on a defense of provocation. In New Zealand, provocation allowed a person who was accused of murder to have their charge reduced to manslaughter if it was found that they were provoked into the action. And part of the issue of the defense of provocation is that obviously there's only one side of the story available to hear. So if Clayton Weatherston wants to say that Sophie Elliott provoked him into stabbing her 216 times, she's not here to tell her side of the story and to defend herself. It's up to the Crown to do that. So it is really... um, messed up because it really centers around basically victim blaming and it is really a gross way for the assailant to wriggle out of the responsibility of what they've done. Clayton's defense team was arguing that Sophie attacked Clayton first with a pair of scissors and he was forced to defend himself and that what Leslie Elliott had heard wasn't Sophie saying don't Clayton but fuck you Clayton. Leslie Elliott of course vehemently denies this. She said that that is absolutely not what she heard and she would have remembered very clearly if she had heard Sophie swearing at Clayton like that. So on Wednesday the 22nd of June 2008 the trial of Clayton Weatherston finally began at the Christchurch High Court. On day one of the trial Clayton's defense team caused a stir when his lead counsel, QC Judith Ablett Kerr, turned to Clayton and said, this man is not normal to the jury. So his defense got started right away, basically painting Clayton as this, um, you know, poor, woe is me, like sympathetic character since childhood, basically. They tried to paint this picture of Clayton being a man who had been pushed to the edge before finally snapping. They created this version of Sophie Elliott as this scheming, provocative girl who was out to get Clayton and dead set on ruining his career and just making life miserable for him. But Also, obviously, Leslie Elliott, who witnessed the entire thing, she came forward and sadly had to go through the horrible experience of recounting what she'd witnessed once again to the jury of her uh, her sweet, amazing daughter. Um, Robert Alexander came forward and talked about how things were really weird and strange after he found out about Sophie's relationship with Clayton. Many of Sophie's friends were called to testify and talked about how manipulative and narcissistic Clayton was and how he always liked to mess with Sophie's emotions. But things would just get worse and worse when the defense started presenting their version of events, completely defaming Sophie's character and making her out to this person that she was not, making her out to be this mean, promiscuous, horrible girlfriend. And then on the 7th of July, 2009, Clayton Weatherston himself took the stand, which is really strange. As you know, in most trials, the defendant pretty much never takes the stand. It almost never, ever, ever, ever works out well for for them. And in this case, it definitely did not work out well for Clayton. It's unbelievable that this man who has been diagnosed as being a narcissist by like an actual narcissist I know that we throw that word around a lot um, quite casually when we talk about people but this is this man's the real deal he is he's he is one he's a real one and as he took the stand watching him and I will splice in some footage as well he is just so gross like just 
repulsive to watch and clearly thinks that he is just charming the pants off the jury and not just the jury but the entire nation because a lot of this trial was televised as you can imagine it was a very high profile case here in New Zealand I remember watching it on the news watching parts of his his testimony and he is so smug and what he probably thought was very charming and impressive was actually disgusting in the entire country just being shocked and horrified at how arrogant this man really was so Clayton totally embraced the spotlight and he just loved telling his story of how hard done by he had been as a child with his anxiety and his glasses and how awful it was to be him. And then he told his version of events of what happened leading up to the death of Sophie Elliott on the 9th of January. According to Clayton, by that time he was in quote, overdrive he was very anxious about university and he had an upcoming job interview that he was stressed out about um, around his position as a lecturer in the economics department his mother said that Clayton had been quite quote unwell in the weeks leading up to Sophie's murder she said that he had been complaining of feeling tired all the time and he wasn't exercising and he was just feeling quite lethargic he had also tripled his Prozac intake beginning just a week before the murder. And Clayton says that he was in his office preparing for the upcoming school year when Sophie Elliott walked in. In this version of events, apparently Sophie was on her way to present a bottle of wine to Dr. Robert Alexander and she stopped to present Clayton with a check apparently for a window she had smashed at his flat um, to get back at him and said, now we're even. On the 8th of January, Clayton spent most of the day complaining to his friends about Sophie. And on the day in question, this is how Clayton described the events unfolding. Apparently, um, it was the morning of his 32nd birthday and he was feeling particularly low. So he took triple his dose of Prozac that morning before heading to the university to prepare for a day of work. He had coffee with a friend um, at some time mid-morning and talked about his family and how he had scheduled an interview for this lecturing position. He talked about his birthday plans and how he was looking forward to that evening and then they talked about how they were going to catch up later on that day. When the friend asked if Clayton had heard from Sophie, he just said no, no and changed the subject. At 11.37 a.m., Clayton checked Sophie's Facebook page. A little bit of time after that, Clayton decided to head to Sophie's home, which was about a 10-minute drive from the university campus. In his laptop bag was a kitchen knife, which Clayton said he routinely traveled with. Clayton arrived at around 12.15 p.m., quote, simply with a few gifts to return and to say goodbye before she moved to Wellington the next day, unquote. Clayton then says he asked Sophie if he should be tested for an STD after her trip to Australia and he claims that this is when she got very mad at him and attacked him first. He claims that Sophie lunged at him with a pair of scissors. Quote, it happened very quickly. I tried to block her and I remember her hitting me around the face with her other hand. My reaction to that was not good. I was very scared. I reached out and grabbed her around the neck very hard. My glasses went off to my left. I just remember a lot of noise and pushing forward into her to push her away. I have memories of a pounding movement and a lot of noise, but nothing directed at me. Background stuff. The next thing I recall is standing or kneeling over her with a pair of scissors in my right hand. The scissors had gone through the front of her throat and I could feel a crunching sound. Not of them going in, but of meeting something hard. Her spine. It's quite vivid. Unquote. After five weeks of testimony, finally on the 22nd of July 2009, the defense and the Crown rested their case. The judge then instructed the jury of 11 to go and consider their verdict. Just the next day, the verdict was in and the jury found Clayton Weatherston guilty of the murder of Sophie Elliott. On the 15th of September 2008, Clayton Weatherston was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 18 years. 
the sentence equated to one month for each of the 216 stab wounds. So in theory, Clayton is up for parole on 2026, which is really not far away at all. And honestly, I think minimum non-parole period of 18 years is just like actually insulting. <laughs> okay, so our justice system in New Zealand is so, so incredibly lax. And the first case I ever covered on this channel was the murder of Alex Woodworth at the hands of Ezra McCandless. And what really stood out to me in this case was that she was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 50 years, right? Which to us in New Zealand sounds like a lot because it is so lax here. And I just can't believe that this man who stabbed this girl to death 216 times and defiled her body afterwards could possibly be out after just 18 years. It's so horrendous. And again, similarly, David Bain, who in his first trial, he was acquitted, in his first trial was found guilty of the murder of his five family members. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 13 years. 13 years for killing five people. I just feel some kind of way about it. But like, what do you have to do to actually be in jail forever? That's what I want to know, you know? So following the sentencing of Clayton, there was a lot of anger and debate around the whole defensive provocation thing because it's such a bunch of bullshit, right? And a lot of women's rights um, activists and spokespeople came out and said this definitely favors men, right? Like they can tell, just make up some bullshit around why women have pissed them off and they killed them and it's the woman's fault. It's almost, it, I think there was one case in New Zealand history where a woman successfully argued defense of provocation. Overall, it's just a shitty defense, right? Like, in my view, there's self-defense and then, you know, anyway, as a result, um, it really did spark discussion around whether or not this should be abolished or not. Heather Henari, who is from the National Collective of Women's Refuges, said, quote, In this trial, we saw the defendant on the stand and we all saw, as the jury did, that he felt justified in his actions and sought to blame his victim. Weatherston's tactics and refusal to take responsibility for his actions were not unusual, but were a classic example of the justifications used by perpetrators of violence every day. Of course, this was a particularly horrific killing, but what was really unusual about this case was that Clayton Weatherston took the stand. The jury, and indeed the whole country, witnessed the self-righteous lack of remorse. We cannot let this go on. It is time to really invest in this in change. New Zealand just cannot afford the social and economic cost of domestic violence anymore. As a country, we must recognise the urgency of this issue and strive for the elimination of violence towards our women, our children and our families. Unquote. Two months later, on the 27th of November 2009, the partial defence of provocation was abolished. Finally, Justice Minister Simon Power, who actually introduced the appeal of this bill earlier that year, said, quote, It effectively provides a defense of, for lashing out in anger, not just any anger, but violent homicidal rage. It rewards lack of self-control by enabling an intentional killing to be categorized as something other than murder. So honestly, it's pretty friggin' barbaric that it was even considered a viable defense option anyway. So sadly, that doesn't really do much for the Elliott family who still had to sit there and listen to their loved one get completely defamed and torn apart on the stand. So following Clayton's sentencing in the end of the trial, man, oh, it was just so sad reading Sophie's legacy. So the Elliott family really, really struggled following the death of Sophie, her mother in particular. Like not only were they so super close, but she witnessed something that honestly nobody in this on this planet should ever 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 have to see or go through and somehow be able to live with that and there was really minimal support from the government from victim support there was just 
not a lot there and she has a lot of loved ones in her life and a lot of support from her co-workers but like still how do you even begin to rebuild your life after going through something like that so following the ending of the trial Leslie Elliott did go on to write the book Sophie's Legacy in a, in kind of a mission to restore honor and dignity to Sophie's name and actually tell the real story of who Sophie Elliott was and that's sort of why I thought it was important to cover this case today I really wondered if it was the right thing to do because when I read the book it was so deeply upsetting uh, it was really heartbreaking to read just oh that mother's pain I can't it just really really affected me but I wanted to share it because that guy is such a piece of shit and Sophie did not deserve that. She didn't deserve to have her reputation tarnished like that. And anyway, after the book was written, Leslie then went on to found the Sophie Elliott Foundation, which sought to educate young women about the early signs of abuse before it escalates to the point of no return or to the point of violence. So she ran the foundation for a few years. She started the Loves Me Not program, which was a traveling program um, that went around different high schools educating young people until 2019 when sadly Leslie made the difficult decision to close the foundation following a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and she's passed the work on to the police but my understanding is the foundation is now totally closed the website is no longer active um, but her family say that Leslie's illness was certainly exacerbated by the stress of everything that she had to go through um, dealing with the grief and the trauma of losing her daughter just horrendous the Elliots say that they've never gotten over the death of Sophie as you can imagine it really sort of defined the family moving forward if you are interested in this case if this has really like struck a nerve for you I really highly recommend reading this book Sophie's Legacy it really is incredible it's very very upsetting so really brace yourself um, when I read it it took me months actually to like get through it because it was a very harrowing read but I think it's really important for us to remember in this in the true crime community that there are real families on the end of this, you know, and I think it provided a really good opportunity for me to take stock of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and am I doing it for the right reasons and how can I navigate this with as much respect as possible, you know, anyway. So that is where we're at. Clayton Weatherston has tried to appeal three times. His All of his appeals have been rejected. So thank God. Hopefully the man stays behind bars. Um, I really hope that he does not get released on parole in 2026. But, you know, I'm sure we'll have an update for you when that happens. But other than that, that is the story of Sophie Elliott and just the horrendous horrendous way that she was murdered by this piece of shit so if you're with me so far thank you for watching um, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up button if you found this video interesting and you'd like to see more go ahead and hit that subscribe button and i'll see you in the next video bye